Welcome to the latest episode in this series of Close Readings. This series we've called The Long and Short, because in it we're talking about a number of modern long poems and short stories, and seeing what connections there might be between them. And as always, our conversation is informed by the rich gathering of articles, reviews, and indeed poems that make up the archive of the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry, and I teach English literature at Balliol College in Oxford, and I'm talking, as always, to Mark Ford, poet, critic, and professor of English literature at University College London. Well, today we are back to poetry, a poetry of a rather intense kind, the American poet Hart Crane, born in the very last year of what Robert Lowell called Queen Victoria's century. So he's our first 20th century poet, and Mark, he's very self-consciously a 20th century poet. He is. His, the work we'll be looking at today, The Bridge, is often thought of as an American epic, and it's an American epic that attempts to do justice to modernity rather in the way that Crane felt and many other people felt that T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland had done justice to modernity. Um, that was published in 1922, and it was the year after that that Crane sort of had the idea for his grand poem, which, like The Wasteland, would address uh, modernity and all the conflicts and and contradictions and difficulties and some of the cultural pessimism which we find in the wasteland does get in to the bridge. But in the main, Crane wanted to go in the opposite direction to Eliot. He wanted to use Eliot's modernist techniques as if somebody had discovered some scientific discovery and was deploying it in a new form for a new product. He wanted to use those, but to connect them to the opposite vision, a vision that derived very much from Walt Whitman of uh, the great of America, a kind of ideal, prophetic, vatic concept of America as embodying all that, well, the poem itself is the bridge to all the things. And Crane himself is not very specific about what utopian vision the poem is actually expressing. But he was very clear that he wanted to use all the kind of disjunctions and fragmentations and also the analysis of history that you get in the wasteland, that the, the bridge functions similarly as a kind of archaeological layering of history going back to Pocahontas and the, the, the arrival of Columbus, indeed, in 1492, um, uh, having sailed the ocean blue. He wanted to go back to that to create this storied vision of America that would do justice to all that was in the concept of the ideal of America, but also to register the ways in which America had betrayed through capitalism, through materialism, through vulgarity, uh, the kind of founding promise, which he felt Whitman had dramatised so wonderfully. So in this session, we have a lot of connections with Whitman, whom Crane addresses directly in the Cape Hatteras section. So it's a poem that I suppose in a way couldn't exist without T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, but it's a poem that is in constant controversial relationship with The Wasteland. I mean, I think Crane in one of his letters talks about what he calls the poetry of negation, and he wants to produce an alternative to that, which I guess is what's bringing in the kind of Whitmanian optimism that you're talking about. And one of the focal points, in fact, the focal point for that whole nexus of emotions in the poem is, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge. So I wonder, would a good way of starting be for you to read the opening lines of yes, the this... dedicatory stanzas or the proem or have we referred to it? Yes, this was written in 1926, part of a great sort of spurt of inspiration on the Isle of Pines in 1926. And to Brooklyn Bridge, which I think is one of his best poems, uh, I'll read the first few stanzas. How many dawns chill from his rippling rest, the seagull's wings shall dip and pivot him, shedding white rings of tumult, building high over the chained bay waters, liberty, then within violet curve forsake our eyes as apparitional as sails that cross some page of figures to be filed away till elevators drop us from our day. I think of cinemas, panoramic slights with multitudes bent towards some flashing scene never disclosed but hastened to again, foretold to other eyes on the same screen. And thee across the harbour silver paced as though the sun took step of thee yet left some motion ever unspent in thy stride, implicitly thy freedom staying thee. So the, with a capital T, a conscious kind of archaism, I guess, or, or, or the language of religious address, 
this is sort of ambiguously an appeal to a kind of non-theological God and also an address to the bridge, I guess. Is that right? Yes. I mean, one, one of the striking aspects of Crane is the romantic aspect of his diction, that he, he was unashamed in, in using early 19th century romantic diction. And that was signalling his connection to poets like Shelley and Keats and the, the whole concept of the poet as a prophetic seer, as a visionary. And yet he wanted to fuse that. Um, and, and Crane is a lot about fusions, attempting to create some kind of synthesis that doesn't necessarily always work with modernity. And the Brooklyn Bridge, which was built, in fact, in the mid-19th century, in the 1860s, became for him a symbol of America. It was both a kind of practical structure. You, you needed it to get across the bridge. And in one letter, he talks about how the bridge is actually only good for quicker lunches, behaviourism and toothpicks, that it's a function of modernity which speeds things up and it enables people to sell more stuff. And I, I should say, from the beginning, it's quite important to know that Crane's day job, while Elliot worked as a banker, Crane worked in advertising. He really was a, an ad man and he worked even for J. Walter Thompson for a while. So the sort of boosterism which is going on in Crane, which connects him to Whitman, I mean, there's an ad man aspect to Whitman, that kind of boosterism is is part of this rapturous, excited, vatic vision of the bridge as both a practical aspect of modernity, but also a symbol of all the ways in which good things can happen, what he calls new thresholds, new anatomies, somehow the new which the bridge will somehow symbolise will enable all kinds of different prophetic visions to arise. He later talks in this passage, doesn't he, of the terrific threshold of the prophet's pledge. Mm. So the bridge is the kind of incarnate symbol of this prophetic pledge which he is making with America itself. So it's what the famous critic Harold Bloom talks about as the American religion, which is to say a kind of sensibility which is full of the possibilities of transcendence and elevation and epiphany and spirituality of all kinds, but is entirely free of dogma. You gaze at the bridge, and most of the visions of the bridge, I suppose this is true to say, are of it rather than from it. Most of the visions of the bridge are are gazing upon it as a sublime object, just as Shelley might gaze upon Mont Blanc as a sublime object. Gaze upon it, but not so much describe it as transfigure it. Yeah. Uh, whereas Shelley does actually give us a sense of what Mont Blanc looks like up there. Mm. <laughs> that the Romantic tradition is it sort of percolated through the 19th century, and this is Bloomian reading of the 19th century as well, as it was one in which the poet's powers to transfigure reality were more important than sort of denoting it. But, I mean, Crane had wonderful taste in terms of the 19th century writers that he admired, who all figure in different ways in The Bridge. Um, obviously, Whitman, we've mentioned, but Melville as well, who gives us the epigraph to Cutty Sark. Dickinson gives us the epigraph to Quaker Hill and Emerson as well. Bloom calls it the Emersonian religion, and Crane is, for Bloom, our listeners may read the introduction and be a bit baffled by it. <laughs> um, but this notion of the Emersonian religion is a celebration which is without doctrine, without any particular kind of rituals, is a kind of assertion of will. It's a kind of self-reliance, to use Emerson's own term. And the bridge itself functions as this as something which Crane has created, in a sense, out of nothing. I mean, is, the bridge exists, but Crane's vision of the bridge is so multi-angled and kaleidoscopic and it comes to mean so many different things that it has, I suppose, to make a kind of corny point, it, it has got some of the diversity of democracy, this multitudinousness containing multitudes, to use the Whitman phrase, and that Crane's bridge is similarly multitudinous in, in the meanings ascribed to it in the poem. Yes, and I suppose, like Whitman, who we'll come back to later, I'm sure, but like Whitman, it's important that liberty or freedom is a part of this mythologization of the bridge, isn't it? The, the lines you read out at the beginning, which describe the seagulls building high over the chained bay waters liberty, with a capital L, I and mean, this is presumably referring to the Statue of Liberty, and then, as it were, across the bay, you have the new incarnation of liberty as as Crane imagines it within the bridge, implicitly thy freedom staying thee, as he says. So there's something about the way that the suspension bridge is sort of hanging in air and therefore has a kind of freedom, but at the same time, as you say, has this extraordinarily kind of robust, prosaic kind of function within the life of New York City. Thanks for listening to this extract from The Long and Short, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. 
To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.